Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get back to it. By the way, just so that you know, uh, you are being recorded. And I need to let you know that. Alright, so we've got people that are going to be gone, so I want those notes. Are you ready? Put Katie up? Yes? Alright, and Shay, the key room, distracting her from the death oh, and yeah. grave site at Ur. Alright, so bring me back to the grave site at Ur. Tell me, who was the guy, the man who was the prince in 1923 who discovered this lovely location uh, and went. Thank you, Sir Leonard. Leonard? Alright, so Sir Leonard is hanging out finding all kinds of good stuff, but what we left with yesterday is we found out that, uh, what the heck is that noise? Oh, whoops. You did pause the music, did you? Uh, I forgot that I didn't pause my Gregorian chant from the last class. My bad. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Yeah. Don't ask. <laughs> yeah, we had Gregorian Chan in the last class. So okay, so at any rate, um, <laughs> whoops. So at any rate, uh, we learned from the gravesite of Ur, it's this nice, deep, uh, domed area. So it obviously began, or, uh, it, it belonged to a monarch, right? So what happened there? All of those different bodies, what happened there? Was it just the king? That died? Oh, was the king, we assume, died of natural causes, and then everybody else commit suicide, to travel into the underworld or into the afterlife with him, and bringing their stuff with them as they go. All right, so who was the queen that went with him? Huabi. Huabi, very good. All right. I'm glad you remember that one. All right, so we see some other cool artifacts from this lovely gravesite, like this one right here. Anyone know what they're describing in this scene? What are they describing in this scene? Okay, we don't have the afterlife here. This is just something that was brought along with them. Farming stuff. All right, so we see peasants with everyday life, goat herders, everyday life, right? And then here, it's more than likely going to be the uh, upper authorities, like the, the bureaucracy, the people that are part of the king's uh, court, for instance, because here we see a guy with a liar, right? So um, the fact is that this is like the, the kind of the levels of society. You've got those that are goat herding, those that are peasanting, and then those that are ruling and having a good time drinking wine and liaring. Okay, so uh, here though we start to see more of the government bureaucracy in this Lape Lazuli, Lape Lazuli tablet. All right, so we see some of the king's stuff going on up here. Who can we tell is the authority in that scene? All right, the dude in the middle. How do you know he's the one that's in authority there? All right, the shiny might be just important, but huh? He's the biggest. There you go. So the way that you confer authority, uh, even all the way into the Middle Ages, before they really got into some quality art doing like vanishing points and uh, you know actual proportion. If you wanted to show God, God was bigger than everybody else. Okay, Jesus was like a head taller than everybody else, and that's how you knew. Yes. So yeah, exactly. Good. So everybody's facing him, and then down below we can see some of his cool instruments of war. You see people being trampled. Isn't that fun? Those are slaves getting trampled by the king's chariot. How fun! Hey, speaking of the wheel, who invented the wheel? <laughs> the Sumerians did! Yes! So we get Sumerian society that invented the wheel. Kudos to them. All right, not only that, but they give us all kinds of fun little things here as well. So if we zoom in on this uh, this tablet, or excuse me, this block of Lape Lazuli, uh, uh, we see this guy. Anyone know what this guy's doing? He's carrying fish. He's a fishmonger. Fishmonger. All right, so it's the fisherman of the area. All right, how about this? What do we see happening here? Again, we got a dude just chilling, drinking some wine, as everyone comes as supplicates to them, right? These guys are probably priests uh, because they're facing in different directions. Who are these guys then? Those. That's the funky looking harp, the liar. All right, so that is, thank you for that. All right, so that is the, that's the entertainment for the court, right? So, we also see some cool things here. Take a look at that lyre. That is an incredibly sweet ancient guitar that you've got here, or harp, if you will, uh, with a golden bull's head on the front of it. How cool is that, right? And then, a lot of emphasis on the bull. Any ideas as to why? Represents a god, exactly. So we'll see that god here in a little bit, but it's representing the god of weather. And so you're very dependent in the ancient world upon the god of weather to take care of you and to look after you, right? So more bull symbols. There's even bulls playing the harps. How fun is that? Yes, okay. Uh, more fun stuff from Puwabi and her lovely gravesite. What kinds of things does this say about her status and her society and 
way they believe things. Good example would be the life groups. Remember the good life groups. It's extravagant. You see, like if you take a look at that necklace or the golden leaves, that's some pretty intricate work that has to be done. Gold is hard to work with without having personal people. Uh, and gold is hard to work with, and so uh, to get that kind of detail and that kind of thinness to it without it bending or breaking, very difficult. And then all of this jewelry, all right, so jewelry was certainly standard for the women, but also for the dudes at the time. Fun fact. All right, here we've got some good stuff. Uh, anyone know what these were used for by the ladies of Kuwabi's country or her court? This is Kuwabi's stuff. So who, what were they using it for? What kinds of things do we have here? A weird game of checker, checkers. This is actually, what? Yes, a cosmetics board. There you are, box, excuse me, cosmetics box. So that's where they keep all their lovely makeup. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then here we've got some different urns. I don't know what those would have been used for, but you can guess this is like a royal cup that would be used for her wine. Then we have this lovely bowl made of lapis lazuli and gold. And then, of course, the lion representing uh, representing Ishtar. Yes? Yeah, yeah, the numerical divisions of 60. So 60 seconds, 60 minutes, um, 60, did I say 60? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then 60 degrees, that was the other one. Yeah. Yeah, so they came up with that concept. Okay, good. Yeah, I was going to talk about that when we get to algebra. Hey, that's good stuff already. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how they did that. They did? Okay. They used those kinds of instruments to help come up with those mathematical theories. All right. So then we start to get into the Assyrians, the Neo Assyrians, the Babylonians. Again, I'm just grouping all these people together because we're in a hurry to get through the ancient world. So we get some cool stuff from the Assyrians, Neo Assyrians, and Babylonians. How are the Assyrians and Neo Assyrians a little different, though? Remember, you heard about it in the video. What? Warlike, far more warlike, so a lot more emphasis on death and destruction of your neighbors because their empire is dependent upon it. You must have death and warfare. Otherwise, if you don't keep fighting or if you lose a battle, what happens? The end of the world. End of the world. The end of your religion and your life as you know it. So therefore, not the greatest theory. But it's going to work for a while, right? You see? Long time, they're going to go and win their battles. All right, so they're going to start to have some economic and agricultural problems, though. Uh, irrigation is going to start to dry up. Therefore, the lands are going to start to dry up, and a lot of people will come flooding as immigrants and, uh, and refugees into the major cities of the empire. And that's going to lead to some problems. But what they will try to do to, uh, to make up for that is develop long-distance trade. If you can't grow your own food, where are you going to get it? Somewhere else, right? So how do you get there quickly? People are sorry. What do you do? Excellent. What do you invent? The wheel. Yes. Two a good. I knew it. All right. So you invent the wheel. So you invent the wheel to quickly get places to get things that you might need to survive. And so it's a market-based, capitalistic kind of society that's going to develop there, uh, as opposed to what we had before, which was what kind of economy. All right, socialist-like, what do they call it? It's on your test. Socialist-like economy. We don't call it socialist in the ancient world. We call it a redistributive, meaning you are the mere peasants. I am drinking my goblins of wine, waiting for your goodies to be delivered at my doorstep. And then I will give them to my priesthood, sort of the cigarettes, and I will, what with it? Redistribute it back to you peasants that are starving and needing it. That was before. Now we're getting more of a market-based capitalistic economy. All right, they're also going to enter into the Bronze Age. Yes, so what makes the Bronze Age so fabulous? Bronze. <laughs> bronze. Yeah, what's it good for? Swords. Metal. Swords. Armor. Weapons. Armor, exactly. All right, so uh, when we have the, the Battle of Troy, right, that was seen as the end of the Bronze Age, by the way. We might throw this, I might talk about this a little more next week, but uh, they, they called it World War Zero. Okay, historians today are calling it World War Zero, where we saw bronze that was dominating for so long as the metal of warfare, the instrument of warfare, and for so many other things. But pretty soon, uh, after the after World War Zero, so many things are going to change across the Mediterranean world, and one of those things that will change is we'll have this group of people called my, the, uh, the Sea Peoples, as they're called, who are going to go rampaging all over the ancient world, uh, killing everybody, and they're going to be carrying some different metals with them, which will then 
transfer us into the next age. So bronze right now, though, that's the one that we need. Bronze is the one that's making things happen. All right, so uh, another thing that they'll have is artistic and cultural achievements, which we will see right here. So this, you've seen this before, maybe? Anybody? Does it exist anymore? The Gate of Ishtar is what this is called. The Gate of Ishtar, the Ishtar Gate. Who is Ishtar? Anyone know? Okay, one of the gods of Babylon, and so uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to be one of the guys building this thing. So the, the, the walls of Babylon had already been uh, in, in process for many years, but King Nebuchadnezzar II is going to start to add to these by making them all the more beautiful. How will he beautify these walls, as you can see right here? How will he be, what? All right, so hanging gardens, we'll get to those in a second. What else is he going to build up here? They're going to make them taller. So these walls were like 50 feet tall on both sides. So before you come into the Ishtar Gate, which is one of eight gates, it was, uh, I believe, the final gate that was created for the city of Babylon. It was the most beautiful. Beautiful because, what's it made out of? Lapis lazuli. All right, so the blue stones. So 50 feet tall. This is like a corridor that you have to walk through before you get to the gate itself. It was seen as, at least temporarily, one of the ancient wonders of the world. It's that Big seven, and then later will be replaced by the Hanging Gardens. But the Ishtar Gate was this beautiful structure, and they've got all kinds of cool, different uh, things put into the walls. So King Nebuchadnezzar's the man, myth, and legend doing it, and we've got the lions that are representing the goddess Ishtar. Ishtar is the goddess of sex and fertility, and uh, so she is the one that uh, makes you have your babies. Okay, and then Aiden, you had a. I'm sorry, what? As a set. Oh, as a set. It was like the oh, yeah. Movie set that they ever made. Well, I'm sure they, they, I think, oh man, I, I'm forgetting my, my, uh, where they built it. I'm pretty sure they've got a replica in Iraq today, but it's not anything like what it would have been. But I'm pretty sure they have a replica in Iraq, and I'm, I think they also might have built a replica in England as well, uh, at some museum. And so I'd have to look up the facts on that one again. I've forgotten now. But, uh, but yeah, it's huge. It was a huge wall. And, and, and took all kinds of, of course, slave labor to make that happen, but was actually built very, very quickly. All right, so then we have bulls all over the place. These are the bulls of Adad, the god of weather. Good. All right, so uh, bulls of Adad. And then we've got the dragons of Marduk. All right, dragons, I don't have any pictures of them, but the dragons of Marduk. Marduk was the national god, or the official god of the Babylonian state, the one that was looking after them the most. Make sense? Yeah, pretty sweet, gar uh, pretty sweet wall, but the gardens were even more beautiful, apparently. All right, anyone know who hung out at the gardens and spent a lot of time in Babylon after conquering it? He's Greek after conquering, well, Macedonia, apparently. All right, Alexander the Great, we'll get to him later, but he's going to spend some time here at the uh, Hanging Gardens. He didn't want to leave for a long time because it was just so beautiful. All right, his men certainly didn't want to leave because it was so beautiful. Anyone know the backstory to it? Hmm? Okay, what was that? You did a report? Okay, so, good. So it's Nebuchadnezzar II, again, a guy is building some stuff, right? So first the Ishtar Gate, and now we've got the Hanging Babylon, uh, Gardens of Babylon. Uh, so he had a foreign wife, and he brought his wife to Babylon, and Babylon is, you know, kind of a desert, okay? And so uh, she was from a very warm, uh, more tropical where she was from, but she was from somewhere that was very beautiful and lush, and when she came to Babylon, it was like a culture shock to her, because she just was like, whoa, I'm not used to this kind of uh, surrounding, like, where's all the green stuff? So, being the man that loved his wife so much, what do you do? He used slave labor to build her a beautiful structure that was one of the ancient wonders of the world, this glorious location of green, and uh, of course, it took a lot of slaves to irrigate this thing and make sure that it stayed green. But dang it! What a story of love! Right? Right? Oh, beautiful. Other cool things that the uh, Babylonians, the Assyrians, and Neo-Assyrians are going to come up with uh, is cuneiform. What is cuneiform? All right, it's writing. And how again did they do it? Okay. So they used... All right, so they didn't want to chip it in rock because that would take too long, right? That was... So they use the clay. Yeah, clay, there you go. So they used clay to uh, carve this. And so they would, uh, unless they wanted to keep it forever, they would then just kind of smooth it over and then reuse it. Okay, so 
use their stylus on this clay tablet. You have a tablet inside your iPad. You can carry around if you were a, uh, a person that was a stenographer, so to speak. Uh, and, and then you would take notes for the king. And they were in very high demand because the king needed that kind of stuff. Yes? This one. I know that they use the uh, base 60 right there. 63, as we said. Base 10, I'm not sure about. It. Yeah, you'd have to look that one, I guess. So, uh, but you can see how it all began. Initially, it starts up here where they would like literally draw the picture for what they said a head should look like, right? That's what it first looked like in cuneiform. Or uh, a carp would look like that. Or a cow, his footprint looks like that. But eventually, as time goes on, it starts to develop into an actual letter, so to speak, from what it used to be. See how that progresses? Yeah? yeah? So here's what a carp used to be. They just draw a picture of it. That's a carp. Hieroglyph. And then as time moves on, that's how you spell carp. Huh? So if they were going to spell out Fairbanks, you'd draw a picture of me. Right? And then, eventually, it turned into letters. Huh? Is that me? Okay, there you go. All right, so now what we're going to do is take a look at Hammurabi, the hammer of Abi, and see what he's up to. Because King Hammurabi is realizing, look, there's no actual uh, written code book of law in that one. It's all just kind of an understanding of you don't do this because otherwise this might happen. And it's all dependent upon whether or not the king remembers rules and regulations when you go and talk to him. But Hammurabi said, look, we need an actual set of written laws. So you can see that they carved them into... into uh, into clay, and then hardened it into like a statue of stone that they would put all over the empire so that everyone could read it. So he called it the principles of truth and equity. All right, so did you read through uh, Hammurabi's code, yes? Uh-huh, okay, I didn't think so. All right, so uh, you're going to want to read through Hammurabi's code right now. I'm going to give you some questions about them. So if you jump onto the reading assignments page... Jump on the reading assignments page. Hammurabi's code should be on there, unless I forgot to link it. It's be real embarrassing. Did I? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Oh, okay. You're saying nah. It scares me. It's a PDF. It's a PDF? Yeah. It worked? BAM! Victory for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the problem. You just didn't do your reading. All right, how about this? Let's start with the first question. Uh, prior to the code, what kinds of problems would result from not having laws written down? Yeah, so the kings definitely did that. All right, so imagine having a king that's bored, and all these peasants come with all of these requests. He's like, ah, I'm great, I'm great. Well, you know, they can make them up. Okay, so that could be definitely a problem for the people. Uh, so really, is this a gift to the people? Are laws a gift to the people? Get away. I mean, lawlessness is much harder for those of us lowly peasants that can't defend birth and home very easily. Not so hard for a king who's hiding behind a wall with an army with him, right? So laws can definitely be a gift to the people. Which of Hammurabi's laws do you think are impossible or, uh, or are bad? Let's just kind of group some questions together. What are some laws that are just bad or stupid or no way that those would work? Or why the heck would they do that? Let's hear like one or two three true. Go for it. You guess first. Okay, good. Because the concept that he's referring to is that if you were born a free man, you were inherently greater than everybody else that was not born a free man, even if you're a free peasant, right? Whereas if you are a, a slave and then freed, you are still free, but you have lesser rights and lesser restitution that's paid to you if you get hurt than, say, an actual born free man, right? And certainly a slave has to be lesser than that. Okay, uh, um, we've got another one. Alright, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, agree, disagree? Definitely an odd one to okay. Much more difficult to enforce, I would say, but pretty easy, actually. Uh, if you are aware of pop culture of men 
saying, oh, it never happens anymore, okay? If a man goes to the king and says, it never happens anymore, behead her, legit. Right? That's the PG-13 version. Of, Get rid of your wife. Okay, yes. Let's see what's wrong with one minute seven one days. He breaks breaks another man's bone, his bone shall be broken. Let me say, if he put up the eye of the will break the bone of another man, he shall pay one gold So he can get one demon or break the bone. Yes, it depends. So again, you put a hundred times. Yeah, eye for an eye, tooth for two. Who came up with this idea? Then maybe that's what it's like again. It depends on. Yeah, there's one time seven guys. I didn't. I swam in the water and I got it. You still that and I guess so. I did kind of drink the water, but I was thirsty. Yeah, yeah that's expensive. I mean, I only drank bottled water. Yeah, I did. I know. But I ate lettuce. I know what it was. It was the lettuce that was washed in regular water. 
I ate a salad. That was a mistake. That and I swam, and I must have gotten water in my mouth at some yeah. point. But either way, Mexican death parasite. Don't get it. I should have done that too, and I didn't. I was stupid. Hey, everybody, get, everybody, get on Kahoot! We're gonna end our day with a little Kahoot. So it's Kahoot.it. Piper, Kahoot.it. Kahoot.it. All right. So a little notice to why we're doing this. Uh, the Hunt website is no longer functional. Remember, I told you that there were free quizzes available. You can get credit for it. They uh, figured out that lots of us were completely backing up the free resources. Now they want to make you pay for it. I don't want you to do that. So I can't find the printed version at the moment. So we're going to do some other little fun things like this instead. Whatever you want. This is just for kicks today. It is not actually great. Why'd you say I know. I just wanted to get her upset, but I knew that she'd get angry and glare at me. Not Gade. Okay, is everybody in there? Who's this swag master? Is everyone in there? All right, here we go. Yeah! Oh, six of you have been paying, paying attention. Oh, there you go. One of you, yes. Katie, yes, <laughs> taking the lead. Wow. Oh, you didn't? All right. Uh, sorry. It's too late now. I thought you were in there. Oh, Virgil, nobody! Wow, that's sad. <laughs> oh, betwixt the rivers, all but one. <laughs> Ancient city. Ancient city. Oh, snap. Puppy dog is back on the leaderboard. Random guess unless you've been doing your reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Swagmaster. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, everybody was listening. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Puppy Dogs, making it up the ranks. I'm up. Yeah, all the above. Mm hmm. Oh, not those peeps. Mm mm. Oh, undies, they didn't wear.
wear those in the ancient world, you silly fools. All right. Anyone know who invented underwear? My clothes. The Romans. My mom. She's a good woman. And <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. All right. So the Romans did because they got so cold when they were in Britannia, the wind kept blowing beneath their togas. So I said we should probably wear some undies. There you go. Uh-huh. That's on the test. Oh, yeah. I was giving you a hint earlier, and you listened. Yes! I don't know. Oh, I bet Cade knows this one. Uh-huh. Oh, so Leonard! Woo! Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Katie's back in the lead. Bobby! Yeah! All right. Star. Mm hmm. Some of you were listening. Yes. Good. Moving up. Mm. Yes. Oh, five of you were listening today. Oh, okay. Katie, puppy dog, you guys were. Yeah! Yeah! All right. No one chose Meerkat. That's too bad. Huh? Oh no, I'm I'm taking three. I'm taking count of your scores now. They're going in there. They're going in. Mm hmm. No. They're going in. Meerkat! Oh. Anybody pick it? No, no, we picked Meerkat. Dang it. Meerkat. Oh, I said this today too. Yep. It did. Oh, ten people listened. Yay. Second, yes. What? Bring it back. All right, seven oh. of you. Okay. Uh huh. Phoenix Master takes the lead. Yeah. All right. Pick me up. All right, there we go. Last question. Ooh, I got this. I got this. Oh. Cylinder seals. And the winner is. Katie! Hello! Alright, nicely done. Woo!